Romans 5 and verse 10. For if, when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his Son, much more, being reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. Let us pray. Holy and gracious Father, we give you thanks for your tender mercies, O God, which are new every morning, and which you so abundantly pour out upon us in Christ Jesus our Lord. And now, O Father, as we open up the text of your holy word, we pray that your blessed Holy Spirit would illuminate our minds and understanding and grant us the grace to experientially know, to experience in the depths of our souls something of the real sweetness and power of this text. Oh, that Christ and Him crucified and raised would be ever, ever so much the more real to us, ever more precious to us, May you help us, O oh Father, to truly treasure Jesus Christ with all the affections of our hearts and to grow into his image. Please grant, grant grace in this hour, Father, and help me to explain this text with faithfulness according to what is written and according to your mind in Christ Jesus. Amen. Well, the burden of the apostle here in this text is to apply the doctrine of justification by the free grace of God through faith alone to our practical Christian experience. In chapters 1 to 4, the, the apostle lays out the plan of salvation, telling us how we are saved. And in chapter 5, especially in the first 11 verses, he applies those truths to our hearts and consciences by telling us how we know we are saved. So as the principal burden of chapter 4 is justification by faith alone, he continues that theme in chapter 5, but now it's with an experiential emphasis as the doctrine of justification is is presented in subservience to and in order to buttress and fortify our assurance of salvation. Historically, Reformed theologians, as I'm sure you all know, have distinguished between three grounds of assurance. One of those grounds is identified as the testimony of the Holy Spirit who bears witness with our spirits that we are children of God. Another ground is the evidences of regeneration, is the Spirit of God is at work in our hearts. He produces fruit in our lives. Many of those fruits are identified in the first epistle of John as freedom from the practice and dominating power of sin's bondage, love for the brethren, Hope and humility as we walk in the presence of God, in the light as He is in the light, and we are confessing our sins, and there is a sensitivity to the sinfulness that remains in our lives and a brokenness for it, and so forth. There are clear evidences of regeneration that He, that he lays out there. But the first and foremost ground of assurance is the gospel and its promises to be received by faith alone. And that's why the magisterial formulation of the doctrine of assurance that's found in the Westminster Confession of Faith, chapter 18, paragraph 2, it says, speaking of this assurance, this certainty is not a bare conjectural and probable persuasion grounded upon a fallible hope, but an infallible assurance of faith founded upon the divine truth of the promises of salvation, and then it proceeds to speak of the other two grounds. 
But the first ground of which it speaks is the promises of salvation. And it, it is those promises that give us that foundation, that secure, unmovable, invincible, Christological foundation upon which our assurance is firmly based and is secure. And it's to this ground of assurance that the apostle alludes here in this text to the primary objective ground of assurance, especially in the latter part of the text when he says, we shall be saved by his life. Our inward subjective sense of security is based on the objective security that we have through the blood and righteousness. Of Jesus Christ alone. Therefore, our salvation is not merely possible. Our salvation is not even probable if we're truly in Christ. But our salvation is certain and it is secure. Now, the text reads For if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his Son, much more being reconciled, we shall be saved. By his life. Note in the first place that this reconciliation transpired while we were yet en enemies. When we abided in a state of enmity against God. When God, in his most righteous hatred for sin, was utterly opposed to us. As he contemplated us in our depravity. When we were estranged from God, when we were alienated from the life of God, when we deserved nothing but the just retribution of divine vengeance, when we had no good in us and no merit in us to commend us to God, then, while contemplating us in that vile, miserable, deplorable, even abominable condition, God, by free and sovereign grace alone, brought us to peace with himself. We were once his enemies. But now through the gospel, he calls us his friends. And as one commentator said, if this is how God treated us when we were his enemies, how shall he treat us now that he calls us his very own friends? And notice that this reconciliation was accomplished by the death of his son. By the death of his son. The death of Christ provides the all-sufficient basis for our right standing with God. This is a perfect reconciliation, effectuated by a perfect satisfaction, based upon the perfect merits of Christ alone. So the magnitude of the state of enmity which previously existed and the magnitude of the worth of the Son who died to remove it. The magnitude of both of those things converge upon this word reconciled, so as to exalt the magnitude of the grace by which we have obtained peace with God. And that's... That's amazing, but what's even more amazing is what the Apostle goes on to say in this text when he says much more. Much more. Much more being reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. This much more expresses superabounding grace. Romans 5 is known as the chapter of the much mores. Five times in this chapter, the Apostle utilizes this expression to emphasize the glory of of God's free and sovereign grace. And each time he uses it, he does so to express, to extol even, the rock-solid objective security that the believer has in Christ. Each time he says this, he's speaking of a divinely established certainty. And when he says much more, we shall be saved, shall be saved, future tense, he's speaking of the future, final, climactic, and consummate expression 
and reception of salvation that we will experience on the day when Christ parts the clouds and comes back in power and glory to glorify us together with himself. So in Christ, our final salvation is secure. This is final salvation that he has in mind. So there is an indestructible bond of unity between the reconciliation accomplished by the death of Christ 2,000 years ago and the benefits of salvation applied by the Spirit in the present and future. Our past reception and present enjoyment of salvation guarantee the future completion of the good work God has began in us. Now, this text shows us that there is an indestructible bond of unity, an indestructible bond of unity between past salvation and future consummation of the same. The apostle roots our conviction of future salvation in our present interest and in the past work of Jesus Christ our Lord. But then the apostle goes on to make this curious statement. If you notice, he binds together our assurance of final salvation, not so much with the death of Christ as we would so often expect, but with the life of Christ. He says, we shall be saved by his life. Now, this is not a reference to the pre-cross life of Christ during the time of what we would call his active or preceptive obedience to the law of God. I, I believe in that and I affirm that and I, I believe that it's a, a necessary foundation for a sound understanding of the doctrine of justification and the imputation of his righteousness unto salvation. But when the apostle says here, we shall be saved by his life, the language of the text suggests that the life in question is chronologically subsequent to the death previously mentioned. This is life after the death of Christ, not before the death of Christ. And furthermore, the future tense of salvation in view suggests life on the part of Christ that is contemporaneous with this future consummation of our salvation and is concomitant with that very same future consummation. So the apostle, therefore, is speaking not of the life of Christ prior to his redemptive work on the cross, but the life of Christ that is the full realization of that redemptive work on the cross that is experienced in his resurrection. His resurrection. So what the apostle is saying is that the resurrected life of Christ saves us. The resurrection saves us. It is central to our salvation, and it is central to the security that we have in it. But how does this work? How does the resurrected life of Christ save us? And to what aspect or aspects of Christ's resurrected life is the Apostle referring to here in this text. And though our verse is ever so brief, thankfully Paul touches on this very same point in greater detail in chapter 8. If you'll accompany me there, verses 33 to 34 of Romans 8. And he says, who shall lay any, anything to the charge of God's elect? It is God that justifieth. Who is he that condemneth? It is Christ that died, yea, rather, is, that is risen again, who is even at the right hand of God, who also maketh intercession for us. So if we look at this text, we, we see that there are significant parallels between this text in Romans 5.10, both of them are speaking about justification as the ground of our salvation and also as the primary ground which, is, uh, which we lay hold, hold of uh, with regard to our assurance. 
And the apostle, when he speaks of the Christ who died, yea, rather, that is risen again, he, he mentions four aspects, at least by implication, of the risen life of Christ, which buttress and solidify and ground our assurance. In the first place, he says this Christ that died is risen again. He's risen again, number one. Number two and three, he is at the right hand of God, which suggests that he ascended into heaven's glory and he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. That's what we call the ascension and the session of Christ. And fourthly, he says, who also maketh intercession for us. So each one of these aspects of the risen life of Christ undergirds and supports the eternal security of the, of the true believer in Christ. And they all serve to reinforce our assurance. In other words, when it says, we shall be saved by his life, he's not only speaking of the event of the resurrection in itself, he includes that, but it's more than that. I think it's speaking of the resurrected life in its totality and manifold fullness from beginning to end, together with all the aspects of his resurrected life and all the redemptive activities that he, as the risen Son of God, carries out on behalf of his people. Let us now mention briefly how these four facets of the resurrected life of Christ consolidate our eternal security in the gospel and establish an infallible basis, as the confession says, for our assurance. If we're going to have an infallible hope of salvation, it is absolutely necessary that we have clarity with regard to the infallible and irrevocable righteousness that has been established by the death of Christ and which is brought into its applicatory realization in all its fullness by his risen life as he represents us before the Father. So in the first place, the resurrection of Christ, the resurrection of Christ considered as the event in itself, Christ himself being dead in the grave and rising from the grave, that is a strong and powerful motive to assurance. How does the resurrection establish our security in Christ and ground our assurance? That's, that's the great question. And it seems like the vast majority, when they consider this kind of question and how the resurrection uh, really establishes our eternal security and assurance, they would probably answer the question by appealing to what we know as the apologetic significance of the cross work of Christ. That is, I, I mean, of the resurrection of Christ as it confirms and validates the cross work of Christ. So the resurrection is seen as God's amen to the cross work of Christ. The resurrection confirms that perfect righteousness was established through his work of atonement, that he uh, accomplished positive righteousness for us by his preceptive obedience to the law, and he fulfilled the negative sanction of the law's curse as he bore the wrath of God and suffered under it in order to satisfy divine justice, while the resurrection of Christ vindicates the cross work of Christ. It openly and publicly authenticates the work of the cross. And so many would say the resurrection establishes our security by demonstrating the absolute veracity of all that was accomplished on the cross. Romans 4.25, he was delivered for our offenses and was raised again for our justification. So our justifi the resurrection considered in terms of how it establishes our justification. But I think the apostle in this text wants to go beyond that uh, when, when he's considering how the resurrection uh, bears up our security as believers. Now, without a doubt, the cross does establish that security. There is a particular and very definitive atonement that is accomplished on behalf of a very particular people. And if we are in Christ, we are that 
people. And so therefore we have security through the cross. But I think the apostle is going beyond that in this text. And to understand the significance of the resurrection, we need to understand uh, something of the significance of what it entails for Jesus before understanding its uh, practical importance for us with regard to security and assurance. Because its significance for us is derivative of the significance that the event of the resurrection itself has for Christ. We are partakers together with him of the very life that was realized in him as he burst forth from the grave and immortalized power and glory. So when Christ rose from the dead to a glorified humanity, he was made partaker of an immutable, eternal, irrevocable, glorified life. Revelation 118 alludes to that when our Lord says, I am he that liveth and was dead, and behold, I am alive evermore. It says, Amen, and have the keys of hell and of death. But he is he that liveth. He is alive. He is perpetually alive, eternally alive. He was dead, but now he is alive evermore. He shall never experience death again. He shall never come under condemnation again. He shall never bear the brunt of divine wrath again. He is alive. And that's why he said in John eleven twenty five, 25, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet, he, yet shall he live so that he is the resurrection and the life. If we believe in him and have been inserted into him through faith, we become partakers by the grace and power of the Spirit of God, of the very resurrection life and power that rose him from the dead. So just as the resurrection ensures eternal and irrevocable life for Jesus, it also does so for us because we are covenantally and spiritually united to him. Therefore, he is the source of our life because he himself is our life, because he himself has that life and possesses that life and bears that life, and his own glorified humanity is our representative and mediator in the presence of God. That's why Colossians 3, 4 says, Christ, who is our life. So when we think about our security, the security of the eternal life that we have in Christ, we must know that what it means is that just as soon would Christ himself die again and perish, just as soon would he come again under the wrath of God, just as soon as he would have to suffer again for sin would those in union with him and represented by him have to perish. His resurrection immutably establishes the eternal security of every true believer. And brethren, if he lives, we live and we shall live. If he dies, and then we must die and perish. If he cannot perish, we cannot perish. If we have embraced him, his indestructible life means our life bears that same indestructibility. But not just the event of the resurrection in itself bears up our security, but also the ascension of Christ. The ascension of Christ. He is at the right hand of God, which means he ascended to the right hand of God upon terminating his redemptive work on this earth. John 6, 38 and 39 says, Where I came down from heaven, the Lord Jesus speaking, not to do mine own will, but the will of him that sent me. And this is the Father's will which hath sent me, that of all which he hath given me I should lose nothing, but should raise it up again at the last day. So he came down on a divine mission, the mission to save his people. The fact that he departed from this earth and went again to glory 
is the unmistakable proof that he has accomplished the mission that he came to fulfill. By the ascension, Christ also opened up access to heaven for us, even as he penetrated the most holy place in heaven, in our nature, as his mediator. He came down and graciously condescended in order to clothe himself with our flesh, to identify himself fully with human nature so as to raise up that very same nature to glorified existence in the joy of the consummate, blessed presence of God. He ascended in order to open up the way into the most holy place of the presence of God and to secure it on our behalf. Ephesians 2.6 says, He has raised us up together, and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Uh, but not only that, the ascension also, by his ascension, Christ was endowed with the fullness of the Spirit, which he pours out on his people as a seal and guarantee of their final salvation. That's why Ephesians 1.13 and 14 says, Ye were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise, which is the earnest of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession, unto the praise of His glory. The Holy Spirit of God Himself is the token of the Father's love to His people, of His special and redemptive love and saving intention toward them. The Holy Spirit of God brings heaven to our souls before He brings our souls into heaven. So the ascension also solidifies and buttresses our security and assurance. But not only that, also the session of Christ. The session of Christ grounds our security. Now the word session comes from the Latin sessio, which simply means to sit. It refers to the act of sitting and of being seated. His session signifies the perfect satisfaction and perpetual forgiveness for all their sins. That's implied by Hebrews 1.3 when it says, When he had by himself purged our sins, he sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high. And as priests ministered in the tabernacle and temple, they never sat. They were not permitted to, to be seated because they had to continually offer sacrifices for sin. But this one, after accomplishing his priestly work on our behalf, sat down, thus signifying perfect satisfaction. But his session also signifies his exalted reign to the position, listen to this, of all authority and of the subjection of all his enemies under his feet. Psalm 110 verse 1 says, The Lord said unto my Lord, Sit thou at my right hand until I make thine enemies thy footstool. Thy footstool. His enemies are under his feet and they are being increasingly put in subjection under his feet. He has defeated them on the cross and he is now reigning in order to manifest and realize that full victorious triumph, which will be consummated in his second coming. And that's good news for us because his enemies are our enemies. And if his enemies are being crushed under his feet, what that means for us is that all our true enemies, our true enemies, are being likewise crushed under his feet. Now, nothing can separate us from him because he reigns in power and he reigns in grace to liberate us from all that threatens our safety and our security in him. So what is it that would on its head and threaten our salvation as we continue on in the pilgrimage of this life? What is it that could separate us from the grace and the power and the love of Jesus Christ our Lord? If Christ is reigning, if Christ has conquered those enemies, if Christ has defeated our sin and our temptation, what is it that could possibly separate us from Him? 
And Christian, there may be times when you might not feel so secure. Even as all the fury of hell itself unleashes its most violent temptations against your soul. But know that your Lord reigns and he will soon totally crush Satan under your feet. And that is the assurance that we have by the promise of God. We shall be saved by his life, by his risen, reigning, victorious, triumphant life as he exercises his kingly office on behalf of his people for our redemption. Finally, the intercession of Christ also grounds our security. His intercession, the event of the resurrection itself, his ascension to the right hand of God, his session at the right hand of God, and also his intercession. Now, if somebody were to approach you and ask, why are you eternally saved? How would you answer? Probably most of us, the first thing that would come to mind is, well, Christ himself is the propitiation that satisfied the wrath of the Father on my behalf, and so therefore there is no wrath left for me, but only eternal favor. Or Christ, my Lord, established redemption by his blood. He set me free from the bondage and slavery to Satan's reigning and tyrannical power, so as to set me free to serve God in holiness and righteousness. Or, I was at enmity with God, and Christ has reconciled me by His blood, and now I have peace with the Father. And all those answers are absolutely correct. But the author to the Hebrews doesn't say that specifically in chapter 7, verse 25, when he seems to answer this very same question. If we were to ask him, why are you eternally saved? His answer is, in the context of emphasizing the perfection of Christ's work, his crossword, he goes on to say, wherefore he is able also to save them to the uttermost that come unto God by him seeing he ever liveth to make intercession for them. <clears throat> he ever liveth, you see. He is alive. And because he is alive, he is interceding continually. And because he is interceding continually, we are saved. Saved to the uttermost. Securely saved. Perfectly saved. Gloriously saved. As I minister down in Mexico and we speak of the intercession of Christ, normally the first thing that comes to the minds of the majority is how Roman Catholicism presents that very same subject. And according to them, nobody can approach God the Father, uh, and so one must, uh, and ni neither Christ, so one must approach Mary and saints and other uh, mediators in, in order to draw near to the to the presence of God or to cause him to be favorably disposed to one and to grant their petitions. But let me tell you, it is absolutely false. And we don't have to go to Christ as believers, as we've embraced him by faith, so that he would convince the Father to do what the Father would not already be willing to do on our behalf. For in Christ, the Father himself loves us. In Christ, the Father himself accepts us. And there is no tension between the Father and the Son and the intercessory work that the Son carries out on our behalf before the Father. The Son doesn't have to convince the Father to be gracious toward us. The Father desires to be gracious toward us and is so and has ordained the very intercession itself so as to secure as much. So the intercession of Christ is not so much vocal. It's not that we stumble into some kind of sin or temptation and then Christ is begging the Father to do what he doesn't want to do. But rather, the intercession of Christ is his eternal, faithful, representational mediatorship for us in the presence of God. Christ in his glorified bodily presence. <clears throat> 
represents all the perfect merits of his redemptive work once for all accomplished. And so therefore his intercession, being based upon his perfect merit, is always effectual. That's why Calvin says he appears before God for this end, that he may exercise toward us the power and efficacy of his sacrifice. I love that word efficacy because Christ ensures the effective and powerful application of the grace he secured through his life and death and resurrection by his intercession for us at the right hand of God. Later, Calvin goes on to say in his commentary on 1 John chapter 2, quote, the intercession of Christ is a continual application of his death for our salvation, end quote. It is the continual application. There is no aborting in the process of application. There, there is no discontinuity between the redemptive accomplished at the cross work of Christ and the redemption applied by the Spirit as the very Son Himself mediates the power and the fullness and the grace of the Spirit to us through His risen life. So now as Christ bears us upon his breast, as he represents us in the presence of God, having our names written on his heart, God, as Calvin says in another place, is no longer disposed to us as an angry judge, but now as a gracious father who delights to bring us to glory. So, brethren... The risen life of Christ is the eternal life of the Christian. His life is our life. His position in glory is our position in glory. His victory is our victory. That's why Paul can say, we shall be saved by his life. We shall be saved by his risen, ascended, glorious, reigning, triumphant, sin-shattering, hell-destroying, immortality-infusing life. For we know that if, when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of His Son, much more now being reconciled, we shall be saved, powerfully saved, permanently saved, irrevocably saved in Christ, oh, so gloriously saved in the risen Son of God by His life. So our salvation is secure if we've taken refuge in Him. We are secure because He is secure. His security is ours through the gospel. And oh, dear brethren, let us ever direct the eyes of our faith to the living Savior. Not only to the past cross work of Christ. Oh, let us ever keep in mind, let us ever treasure, let us ever cherish the cross work of Christ. But let us not obscure or neglect or be forgetful of the glory and the efficacy of his resurrected life. May the eyes of our faith ever be directed to the living Savior. And may all the darkness of uncertainty and doubt dissipate as we contemplate the glory of the risen Son. Amen.